All right, we've been asking a question in the book of Matthew. What did Jesus do? That's a critical question, amen? Here's why it's critical, because what Jesus did, as recorded for us in the Gospels, is what Jesus is continuing to do through who? Us, his church. So as we understand what he did in the Gospels, we understand what he is continuing to do through us as he transforms us into his likeness and works through us by the Holy Spirit. So we've been learning it's not about just knowing a bunch of stuff, a bunch of facts and information and filling in the blanks. It's transformation at the heart level. And we're going to emphasize that today, at the heart level, not just in our outward behaviors, but what God is doing in our heart. Last week, we saw Jesus on the mountaintop. Remember that? He sent the crowds away. He sent his disciples away, and then he went up to pray. And again, that's what Jesus is again doing in us, drawing us away to the Father for prayer. It's a critical part of our walk with him. And then he went down on the storm, and he met the disciples in the storm. And again, that's what Jesus is continuing to do in meeting us in the storms. And can I say, and I didn't even mention this last week, it's how Jesus wants to use us in the lives of other people, meeting them in storms and encouraging them through that time. Today we're going to see what Jesus does when he arrives on the other side of the lake or the Sea of Galilee. God wants to speak to you today. Do you believe that? Father God, take your Holy Spirit, please, and teach us by your word. Uh, Just lay open our hearts, um, not just our ears, but our hearts to receive what you have for us today. Amen. We are in Matthew chapter 14. We'll be moving into Matthew chapter 15. If you have Bibles... I'm going to put the scripture up on the screen. It's just for me to be able to move through things a little bit more efficiently and highlight some things. When they had crossed over, they came to the land, they came to land at Gennesaret. And when the men of that place recognized him, they sent word into all the surrounding district and brought to him all who were sick. And they implored him that they might just touch the fringe of his cloak and as many as touched it were cured. So they ended up across the lake. Remember, there was a storm, and Jesus got in, and and I created another little map for you. I love that little yellow boat. That's the disciples and Jesus, right? So just to help you understand that, some of you saw this last week. The the green is Bethsaida, is where he was praying on the mountain. And they were going to go across the top part of the sea to the red uh, Capernaum, but they actually end up in this other place. Gennesaret. So it's a little further south, and not sure why they ended up there other than the plan and providence of God. That's where people needed to be healed, right? So you notice that as soon as he steps on shore, he's just again met with the needs of people, not just physical needs, but many spiritual needs, emotional needs. He's just bombarded. And you remember a few weeks back, he actually went across to kind of get away because we talked about this side of the Sea of Galilee is just densely populated. So he can't get away. And and I don't want to say that he wanted to get away, but there were times where he did get away just to again spend time with the Father. So he comes back, and then there's this interesting piece about touching just the fringe or the hem of the garment. We need to talk about that a little bit. Remember we talked about it way back in, I think it's Matthew 9, about the woman who had the hemorrhage. Remember that? And she snuck up behind Jesus and touched the hem of his garment, and he, she was healed. So what was going on here? We This is just kind of a review because we actually covered this quite in depth. Uh, the Hebrew men... Uh, We're told back in Numbers 15 to wear this garment. It was called a talit. And it was used in a a couple different forms. There was this kind of uh, big flowing thing that was worn. And then sometimes it was worn kind of as an undergarment just underneath the outside. And so you can see the little tassels there. That was probably what these people were touching. And we, we referred to 
uh, last time we talked about this, some Old Testament passages that talk about healing in his wings or fringes or tassels. So there's kind of a connection there. But I just want to show you, here's probably what was happening. And it's absolutely amazing when you just take what the text said. All who were sick were coming to him, and as many as touched that were immediately what? Healed. That is phenomenal. The power flowing from Jesus for physical healing. Absolutely phenomenal. The compassion that he had that even he would want to extend that to these people. So we see this amazing kingdom work done, never been seen before. The king is now walking the planet, showing his power, showing his kingdom work, showing his compassion, and everybody is amazed except a few. So when we get into chapter 15, this amazing work now is kind of like momentarily stopped because the religious elite show up. As we move into chapter 15, the Pharisees shows up. And they're not so much impressed with this kingdom work that Jesus is doing. They're looking for opportunities to attack him. So they do it. And they do it with their religion. And here's what we're going to learn. Let me just preface. Here's what we're going to learn as we now move into chapter 15. That Jesus as he's confronted with these religious leaders, shows that he hates religion. He confronts it every time he's, he clashes with it. When we read through the Gospels over and over again, we see kind and tender words spoken to people who have great needs, but what are the type of words he gives to the religious leaders? That's the only time he speaks harshly because he hates what they're doing, he hates the impact on people. So what we're going to see here in chapter 15 is three reasons that Jesus hates religion, and those three reasons still exist today, and he continues to hate religion. He hates it in his people when it creeps in, he hates it in our culture, he hates it in the world. He confronted it consistently. So I want to say this up front. Jesus didn't come to give another religion for people to follow. Jesus came to give himself. He said, I am the way. He didn't say, my religion is the way. He said, I am the way. He lays himself out as the one to follow, not a religious system. So this confrontation with religion and the religious people starts right there in verse 1. Then some Pharisees and scribes came to Jesus from Jerusalem and said, Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat bread. And he answered and said to them, Why do you yourselves transgress the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? For God said... So the caps mean, this is Old Testament, honor your father and mother, and he who speaks evil of father or mother is to be put to death. But you say, whoever says to his father or mother, whatever I have that would have been a given, uh, would have helped you has been given to God, he is not to honor his father and mother. And by this you invalidated the word of God for the sake of your what? Your tradition. So the question in Jesus' response reveals the number one reason or the first reason that he always clashes with the religious system, why he hates religion. He hates religion because religion and the traditions that go along with it veil and in the minds of people invalidate the given word of God. So the religious elite here are concerned about tradition. Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? And the specific tradition they're concerned about is how you're supposed to wash your hands. I want to show you Mark chapter 7. It's a parallel passage that helps illustrate a little bit more about this. The Pharisees 
and some of the scribes gathered around him when they had come from Jerusalem and had seen that some of his disciples were eating their bread with impure, that is, unwashed hands. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they carefully wash their hands, thus observing the what? Traditions of the elders. And when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they cleanse themselves. And there are many other things which they have received in order to observe, such as the washing of cups and pitchers and copper pots. So Mark goes into much detail about this religious system. A little bit of background to how did the Jewish people get this religious, this, these traditions passed on, called here the traditions of the elders. Now, you need to go back a number of hundreds of years to the time of Ezra, track with me now, when the people of God were in captivity, they were in exile to Babylon. And they were there, why? Because God says, your lack of faith in me and my guidance has led you to disobey the law I've given you, so I'm going to put you in a timeout. <laughs> Parents, you ever do that? little time out now. You're going to be here. You're going to be into the thumb of, thumb of Babylon because I want you to learn by your faith you follow my law. Well, they're going to be released from exile now, so the religious leaders say, let's help the people. Let's give them some guidelines. Let's give them some traditions so that they don't get off track again because nobody wants to go right to, to time out again, right? So with, I would say, very good intention, the religious leaders said, let's create some traditions. Let's create some guidelines to help the people obey God. So what was developed was the law of God given by God, the Ten Commandments and others, and then the traditions of the elders to try to help the people keep the law. So at this time, this is what the Jewish people had. They had the law, but then they also had the traditions. Everybody following that? These traditions were handed down for many years verbally or orally, but then they were actually written down, and they exist today. You've heard of the Jewish Talmud? That's it. It's the Jewish traditions passed down for centuries on how the Jewish people can walk in this obedience to God. So the part we're getting into here, when you read the Old Testament, it does talk about impurity and, and uh, ceremonial cleanliness. And so here's what they're getting at. Why don't your disciples, Jesus, do the things that we've told them to do to try to keep the Old Testament law by washing their hands? But how are you supposed to wash your hands? That's the question. Well, here's what they said. And I want to put up on the screen a section from a book called The Life and Times of Jesus the Messiah, written by a Jewish man who became a follower of Jesus. So I think, we, okay, here it is. The minimum amount of water to be used in washing your hands was a quarter of a log, which is defined as enough to fill one and a half eggshells. That's important, all right? And the water was first poured on both hands held up with the fingers pointed upward and must run down, up, run up the arm as far as the wrist and must drop off from the wrist for the water was now itself unclean having touched the unclean hands. Got that? And if it ran down the fingers again, it would again render them unclean. The process is repeated with the hands held in the opposite direction with the fingers pointing down and when they and then finally each hand was cleansed by being rubbed with the fist of another everybody got that something like this a really strict jew would do all this not only before a meal but also between each of the courses why aren't your disciples doing this they're impure because they're not following the what? The tradition of the elders. Now that seems silly to us. We can write that off very quickly. But we need to understand that this was deadly serious to the religious leaders. 
I found a few quotes of rabbis over the years that said this. Zeal leads to cleanliness, cleanliness to ritual purity, ritual purity to self-control, self-control to holiness, holiness to humility, humility to fear of sin, fear of sin to saintliness, and saintliness to the Holy Spirit. Does that seem backwards to you? Whoever eats bread without first washing his hands this way, it is though he had sinned with a harlot. Whoever makes light of washing of his hands will be uprooted from the world. A person who despises the washing of hands before the meal is to be excommunicated. So we need to get into this mindset. This is where the religious elite were. You have to do these traditions. You have to do it right, and you have to do it consistently. Jesus, why aren't your disciples following our traditions? Now, I want to say again, I think originally it was very well intended. But I'd say it got a little bit off track. You think so? It got a little bit askew, and it was no longer helpful. It was more of a distraction and even a burden. So notice how Jesus answers the question. It's beautiful. Like he often does, he answers a question with a what? Question. And he answered and said to them, Why do you yourselves transgress the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? And then he moves on to an example. He says, here's what you've done. He says, the traditions, the fact that my disciples aren't keeping them is not the problem. The problem is the traditions are keeping you from seeing the intent of God's word And what obedience to God's word will do. The religious traditions had become more important than the word given by God. You remember? There was the law of God given by God and there were traditions. And at this point, when Jesus steps onto the scene, which was more important to the people? The traditions were more important than the law of God. Their traditions did two things. It actually aided people in disobeying the law of God because in the minds of people, the law had become invalidated, unimportant. The traditions had become more important. So again, the first reason Jesus hates religion is because religion makes the word of God secondary to the traditions or opinions of people, namely the leaders of religion. So Jesus gives an example. So he moves on from this tradition of washing to this other tradition. He says, God said, who said it? God said, he's quoting now the law of God. God said, honor your father and mother. And the one who speaks evil in father and mother is to be put to death. He's quoting from Exodus 20 and Deuteronomy 27. But tradition was developed by the elders so that this honoring of parents at a particular time in life could be done away with. All they had to do was, well, let me show you this passage in Mark 7. Again, it helps with this. He was also saying to them, you are experts at setting aside the command of God in order to keep your tradition. For Moses said, read it with me, honor your father and your mother He who speaks evil of father and mother is to be put to death. But you say, here's what God said, here's what you say, if a man says to his father or his mother, whatever I have that would have been helped to you is Corbin. It means it's dedicated or given to God. You no longer permit him to do anything for his father or mother. Thus, read it, invalidating the word of God by your tradition. So do you see what they did? God says, honor your parents. And he says, in a specific way, when they're older, you use your resources to take care of them, to honor them. So tradition came along and says, well, we'll give you a little loophole. You just take, call all of your stuff, all of your money, all of your resources, call it Corbin, call it dedicated to God, so it can only be used for God and not who? Your parents. They have a loophole now. 
So the very tradition given by the elders didn't encourage obedience. It actually kept people from it. Something well-intentioned at the beginning became evil and destructive and even increased disobedience because the word of God became secondary. So I'll say it again. Jesus hates religion because religion, through tradition, veils the transforming word of God. And as we go on in our text, we see the second reason Jesus hates religion. And let me just tell you what it is. Jesus hates religion because religion is only concerned about outward action, not heart transformation. So we go on to verse 7 in our text, Matthew 15. You hypocrites, rightly did Isaiah prophesy of you. Again, this is a quote from Isaiah 14, I believe. This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the precepts of men. And after Jesus called the crowd to him, he said to them, Hear and understand, it's not what enters in the mouth that defiles the man, but what proceeds out of the mouth, this defiles the man. I'm going to skip to verse 15. Peter said to him, explain this parable. It was like a mini parable. Jesus said, are you still lacking in understanding also? Do you not understand that everything that goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and is eliminated? That's basic human biology, right? Too much information probably. But the things that proceed out of the mouth come from the heart and those defile the man. For out of the heart come evil thoughts murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, and slanders. These are the things which defile the man, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile the man. So let's just walk through that little section. Verse 7. He says, you're hypocrites. I think we all know what that word means. It comes from actually a theater background where you put on a mask and you pretend to be a somebody else. You're not really presenting who you really are you're presenting somebody from behind a mask it's what it meant their religion their traditions allowed them to put on a mask so they looked good to other people but it's not who they really were Je Je uh, jesus quotes from i guess it's isaiah 29 it says they had lip service they said the right thing from behind the mask but nothing changed in the heart and their worship, or supposed worship, it says, was vain. It was pointless. It had no value to God, even if people thought it looked very, very good. I need to, again, give you an Old Testament con connection, because help. I want you to understand that this religious tendency in people keeps coming up all the time. In the Old Testament, it was the same way. God gave people this way through sacrifices by their faith to be close to God and after a while they were just throwing animals on the altar but their heart was cold towards God the the prophets speak to this often Malachi the prophet says this oh that one of you would shut the temple doors so that you would not light useless fire on my altar I am not pleased with I will not accept an offering from your hand. Why? He, he said, this is what I want you to do. I want you to offer these sacrifices. But he saw their heart. Their heart was not in it. It was just a system. Jesus hates religion because religion puts an emphasis on the outward. And Jesus wants to change the what? The heart. He always aims at the heart. He never just aims at behavior. He aims at the heart. The emphasis for the religion, for the traditions, is about the show, about looking good, being well-respected because of what you do, not heart change. The emphasis of religion is going through motions, not being transformed. 
Jesus says later, and it's actually a passage we'll get to in the spring, he says, everything that these people do is to look good. Pause right there. Do you ever get trapped into that? You just want to look good for people. Your heart is sick. But you don't want to look sick to people, so you put on a what? A mask and a show. God has made it very clear that he always starts with the heart to bring his change. He's not impressed by religious duty. Let me just show you a few passages just to highlight that. Psalm 51 says, the sacrifices of God are what? A broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. That's what he wants us to give him, our broken, contrite heart. And God never despises that. The prophet Ezekiel, looking actually to the time when Jesus would bring this new work, and he says, I will give you a what? A new heart, a new spirit. I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh, and I'll give you a heart of flesh, this tenderized heart that is sensitive to my spirit and brings change even outwardly but from the heart and then Hebrews says for the word of God is living and active sharper than any two edged sword piercing to the division of soul and of spirit of joints and marrow and, is dis and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the what the heart that's what the Word of God is intended to do, is impact our heart. Something that traditions can never do, but the Word of God can. Jesus hates religion because religion veils the transforming truth of God's Word. Jesus hates religion because it's only concerned about the outward, looking good, not heart-rendering transformation. One more reason in this passage that Jesus hates religion. He hates religion because it's so harmful to the people that he came to save. It's destructive. So as we go on to this text, verse 12, Then the disciples came and said to him, Do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this statement? I love that. They were offended. Jesus says, I don't really care that they're offended. This is the truth. That word offend, it's interesting. It has that word scandal. It's like they, this was a scandal now because Jesus confronted their traditions. Then he answered and said, every plant which my heavenly father did not plant shall be uprooted. Let them alone. They are what? Blind guides of the blind. And if a blind man guides a blind man, both will fall into the pit. Hmm. They're offended. Yeah, and religious people get offended when you start talking about their systems as being ineffective or even invalid. But Jesus isn't concerned. He's not concerned about offending these religious leaders he needs everybody that he's talking to at that moment to understand this system will not help you. This system will not help you. It will actually harm you. It's not from God. It's uprooted eventually. And Jesus said, it's the blind leading the blind. Now that's a phrase we use actually in our culture. Guess where it came from? It came from Scripture. It's the blind leading the blind. And when you stop and think about it, that is a tragic image, is it not? A bunch of blind people being led by other blind people, and they end up where? In a pit. In a pit. They both do, those that are leading them and those that are being led by them. That's why Jesus hates these religious systems because it's leading people into what? A pit. I'll just call it hell. That's where it ends up. 
Jesus says this later on. Again, we'll get this in Matthew 23. He says, woe to you blind guides. He says, you blind guides, you strain out a gnat and you swallow a camel. You're blind, you can't even see what you're doing. And I hate what you're doing because people are following in it and they end up at the same place you do in the pit. So understand, religious systems are very attractive and they're very appealing. Why? Because they appeal to our pride. They appeal to our sense of we can do something for God. We can make ourselves look good to God. We can make this effort. And Jesus says, no, it doesn't look good to me, and it ends you in hell. I hate these systems. Please understand, Jesus doesn't want a lot of people making effort and trying hard to please him. He doesn't want that. What he wants is people seeing what he has done and the effort he has made, amen? And that through his effort on our behalf, we are then pleasing to God. It's not a system, it's a person doing something for somebody else. Some of you here today might be trying really hard to clean yourself up for God. I'll just say it doesn't work. It's a system. However you're trying to do it, it's just a system that if you continue on that system, you end up in a pit. An eternal pit, but ultimately now it's a pit of self-effort. It's a pit of self-esteem. It's a pit of frantic activity. It's a pit of guilt and feeling guilty because you didn't quite get it done this week yet again. It's exhausting, isn't it? Jesus came to give life. He came to give life. And he says, I want you to have freedom. I want you to have wholeness. I want you to have shalom, this completeness. Not through your efforts, but through my effort. So what have we learned? First of all, Jesus hates religion. Can you say that? Now that word hate, it's a strong word. I didn't know if I should use it or not. But again, as we go through the Gospels, you see this righteous hatred that Jesus has towards this system. Why? Because it seems to shroud and veil and dismiss the Word of God, and the Word of God brings transformation. He hates it because it's just about the external, and nobody ever impressed God by their actions. And yet religion emphasizes that. It's destructive. He hates it because that is the avenue. I mean, there's all these world religions that are people are been sucked into by these religious leaders. Say, do this, do this, and don't do that, and it ends always in one place. It's in the pit. So I don't know that it is too strong of a word. He still hates religion, and he confronts it in us when we've just tried to look good for people but not dealt with hard issues, it's easy to get trapped into that because our pride says, don't let them see what's really going on inside of you. And if you can hide it from God, do that as well. See, religion is about doing. Jesus says, you can't do anything. I've done it. It's completed. Live in that. I'll receive you. Religion is like this treadmill. I don't like treadmills anyway, but some of you maybe get on them. I try to avoid them if I can. This treadmill where you're, you're running really fast, but where are you going? Yeah. And religion is like that. You're running really fast, but you're making no progress. Jesus says this, I'm the vine... You be a branch, and then I'll give you life. That's a much better system, isn't it? It just comes from Jesus into us. Jesus says, apart from me, you can't do anything. You're just on a treadmill trying to do a lot of good things that end up nowhere. So I'm just going to close with a few questions for you today. Here's the first one. What are your traditions? How do your traditions help you abide in Jesus? 
Now, our life groups are going to get into this a little bit because the same word traditions is actually spoke of in a positive way in some of the New Testament. So we all have traditions. Churches have traditions. Now, evaluate that. Can you think about that a little bit this week? These things that I'm doing traditionally in, in my walk with God, are they keeping me close to Jesus? Are they helping me be tran being transformed by the Word of God? Or are they just making me look good? Second question. How is your heart today? You look good. Hey, I'm looking at you. You look good. Some of you put on your best jeans. Yeah. You're looking good. You're probably showered today. You look good. But guess what? I can't see your heart. How's your heart? Is it in good shape? When's the last time you had a heart-to-heart -heart talk with God about how you feel, what you're thinking, what you're struggling with? Maybe God just wants to come in and do a lot of heart work with you today. This last question I'm going to aim directly at our young parents with young children. Let me ask, are you teaching your children religious traditions or exposing them to the life-changing power of God's Word? Are you parenting the heart or just the behavior? Now, there's a reason that we as parents tend to parent the behaviors because when our children behave badly, who looks bad? <laughs> Stop doing that. I'm looking like a bad parent when you do that. So again, we see this pride issue. Maybe you need to parent a little bit deeper. Why are they doing that? Maybe there needs to be a discussion at the heart level instead of just a swat on the butt because they did something wrong. Tradition is outward. Truth is inward. And even with our children, our grandchildren, we want to see them process truth at the heart level. Amen? and deal with how they're feeling and, and why they want to do this thing. Let's get to that by God's grace. Let's work with God in that. Tradition has to do with ritual, but truth has to do with what's real inside of us. Tradition is something you keep, but let me, parents, understand this. Truth is something that keeps you. So if we can get the truth into the hearts of our children, it keeps them instead of just encourage them to do the right thing. By the way, parents, just this morning I found a great website and I printed it on some little slips of paper. Um, it's called Parenting from the Heart and Parenting to the Heart. So you can have these afterwards as you go on. So I ended with some questions. I can't answer them for you, right? I encourage you to ponder that and think about that. And here's what we're going to do next. Musicians are going to come up, and we're going to sing a prayer. Uh, we even sang a couple prayers to start the service. Did you notice that? Not all worship songs are statements necessarily of praise to God. They're statements of desire through prayer. And so this song that we're going to sing together, it's a prayer that, God, would you change me from the inside out? Do you want that this morning? Do you want the heart work done this morning? So we're going to sing this song together with that intent that God would come even today and work at our heart level and maybe root out a little bit more of that religion that so easily gets stuck inside of us. I'll begin us in prayer, and then the musicians will just take us right into communion. Father God, thank you so much for your heart for us Thank you so much, Jesus, that uh, you did everything so that we could rest in you and not somehow run to be pleasing to you. Lord, help us see religion in our lives and the destructive nature of it. Lord, I'll even pray for parents here today, Lord, uh, how easy it is to just look at what the kids do and not what's going on inside of them. Would you help them even today, Lord, with this generation uh, 
Deal with heart. Deal at that level. So Lord, we just sing this song to you as our prayer that you would change us. Jesus, make us more like you, even at this 